Oh, aloha, folks. It's Antonio with hypnosisproductreviews.com. Today, I've got my very special guest and friend, or at least that's I call him a friend, got Keith <laughs> Livingston all the way from Seattle, Washington. How are you doing today? Hey, Antonio. Good to be here. Thanks for the uh, introduction. I know, bunny, bunny ears. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry. When, when the camera's off, then I can, start, I can start talking some junk about you. So you're kind of um I've known of you for a known of you for a long time. You're kind of on the um you kind of on the, the background of uh, hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Not really um in the whole hypnosis community, I guess which makes you kind of special. Can you give my audience a uh, a background of yourself, how you got into this? Well, let me say first of all my mother thinks i'm special so i appreciate that you you also share that opinion yeah uh when i was about 13 years old somewhere around that age i picked up a book called self hypnosis leslie and lacron and i was fascinated by it and the power of the mind and you know all that you could do and so uh that kind of led me to studying psychology a bit as i was growing up i read everything i could but it didn't really resonate uh with me and then in the 80s, I, uh, there was a bookstore I used to like to go to, and there was a cute gal that worked at the, at the cashier. She was the cashier. She had one mechanical arm, and uh, I liked her, and the psychology section was kind of where I could keep an eye on the cashier. And so one day I'm in there, and I pick up uh, Awaken the Giant Within, and in the forward in those days, uh, Anthony Robbins said, I'd like to thank the developers of this technology, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. And, you know, he was calling it NLP in those days. And so I thought, well, why don't I just go read them? And I picked up Frogs into Princes, which is a, uh, one of the early NLP books, which is essentially a seminar, a transcript of a seminar of Grinder and Bandler. And I was totally hooked. Uh, I, the NLP is so different than what you see in mainstream psychology. It's, it's, uh, although it's technically it's part of the cognitive uh, approach to psychology. It's about how your thoughts affect your feelings and what you do. But it's not based on abnormal psychology like most psychology is. It's extremely practical, it's fast, and it just immediately made sense to my mind. So I bought everything I could, read everything I could, bought programs, went to a national uh, NLP conference in 2000, did uh, an NLP practitioner training in 93 and a hypnosis training and just kept going on from there. Eventually went into teaching, uh, did therapy professionally for a while, but I'd been a teacher. Uh, I've been a teacher for a long time. I've taught a lot of different subjects and that's really uh, something that I, I'm good at. So I started to take my knowledge and form it into programs uh, the, the skill that I have, I'm like Paul Schaefer to David Letterman, right? <laughs> Schaefer just crystallizes something that Dave says and hands it back to him in a very compact and understandable form. And so that's what I do with NLP and hypnosis is I make it easy to understand and I build programs for people that want to get better at it uh, on oh. my site, hypnosis101.com. Dude, if you could teach this chimpanzee conversational language with your programs, it's a pretty solid program. Um. It's kind of funny you mentioned the, um, but it's not like abnormal psychology, you know, the whole, um, the whole thing with Freud that the Oedipus complex and that I never really, really got, really understood that. I mean, I understand it, but I don't, I don't think every kid has a desire to be with his mom. No, it doesn't make any sense. And a lot of it, some of it might. And if you look at the statistics, I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in results, right? And if you look at results, yeah. I, I read this years ago on the Surgeon Generals of the United States website, and they have since taken it off, or at least I can't find it. Psychoanalysis, for instance, is not effective in treating phobias. It's not. And you know why? It's because it's, it, it's based on assumptions that just have nothing to do with, with phobias. Phobias are simple. You know, they getting inside that's the other thing psychology typically one of the goals that they have in psychology is insight into your problems they want you to understand where they came from but there's two problems with that one is that having insight into your problems doesn't necessarily solve them you can i know tons of people who know where their phobias came from 
and uh, that doesn't cure their phobias. No. Nope. So the, the other problem is that sometimes that's a long and painful process to get insight. Uh, I, I'm not saying insight's bad. Sometimes insight helps, but it's it shouldn't be the goal. Yeah. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah, it doesn't really doesn't really help. I was going to follow it up with a funny joke because I'm always full of them, but I totally forgot. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually, speaking of jokes, we're going we're gonna to get into the uh, main material. Give my audience a jokes. So I know you're full of ambiguous jokes. Full of ambiguous jokes? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll think of one as we go, and I'll, I'll put it in the middle of there where sometime <laughs> okay. when you least expect it. Um, you're going you're gonna to slip it in. You're going to be like, uh, what's that? The... the Freudian slip. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know he was a transvestite, but go on. <laughs> oh, boy, you're bad. See, there it is. There it is. But don't. <laughs> so, uh, one. Are you waving to people? Uh, uh, no, thank you. I'll be here all week. Uh, like, thank you. Thank you. I also do, I also do kids' parties. <laughs> so, the one thing I wanted to get really good at is conversational uh, conversational language. I guess um, <laughs> conversational <laughs> language is a good thing. Conversational hypnosis. Yeah, conversational language. I just talk to people like, hello, me, like you, talk later. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. I mix some words. We get good at conversational hypnosis and specifically the Milton model. Uh -huh. uh, pick up your program, the practical guide to conversational and hypnosis to covert and conversational hypnosis with Keith Livingston and Jeffrey Ronning. Freaking killer program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, let's dig into it. Talk about um, conversational language. Okay. Conversa conversational hypnosis, the Milton model. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you a question before we, as we dig into this actually, is so what interested you? What, why do you want to become better at conversational hypnosis? For one thing is um, uh, for change work, to help people change. Also for sales, for a current job, which I'm not going to be at much longer. Um, basically being able to persuade people, persuade people to, uh, to my ideas. Another thing that I'm working on is helping, um, you might know this, I'm helping hypnotists to create some uh, better sales copy. Mm-hmm. And so maybe sometimes if I need to convince them and sometimes with people that need to, um, that need better marketing, it might not, they might have a, um, an emotional, <clears throat> sorry, they might have an emotional block that's, that's holding them back. So I want to be able to, if I talk to them, I want to be able to help them get past that emotional block. So basically uh, persuasion and it's an interesting thing to think about persuasion for me. And I thought about it a lot because persuasion and therapy is not very much different than persuasion in sales. And it's not very much different than persuasion in relationships. And I think those are the three big areas that people look at. They want to help people overcome blocks, whether in therapy or something else. They want better relationships. Uh, and they want, uh, many of them want to sell. And for a lot of people, sales is a dirty word, but almost every situation you're in, is some sort of negotiation. If you're communicating with another person in a relationship, for instance, there, there's negotiations going on all the time. And to be able to effectively get your ideas across and pass their whatever barriers they might have is super important. Okay, so the, those are very common. The, the, thing, the things that you said are very common things that I hear when people approach me about covert hypnosis and conversational hypnosis. Okay, so how would you like to start digging in? Uh, well, one thing, let me see, look at this manual. I have, um, you know, you're talking about pacing language, well, using pacing language, pacing statements. Like, when I use them at work, you know, my main job, what I do is I, <laughs> I um, convince people to do a timeshare presentation to um, save money at activities on their vacation. So it's, I don't have, really have it, something here. Usually I'll have a, um, uh, we call it a vacation planner. It'll basically be a planner with all the, uh, basically it'll say like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, da, da, et cetera. So I'll do it simple. I'll say, you know, so today's Monday, you leave, you leave this Friday, you're looking to do a boat Thursday. Perhaps you'd like to get your, uh, your hands on some discounts, which I know that all those statements are true, 
but they, for some reason, it just feels kind of awkward. It almost feels like, it almost feels forced, if that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, it does make sense. And I think that's, a, that's also a common thing as people learn the hypnotic language uh, patterns. L let me back you up just a little bit. So you're talking about uh, a pattern that's called pacing current experience. Yep. And that is a famous, famous pattern in Ericksonian hypnosis and conversational hypnosis. And essentially, it means uh, saying things that you know are true in another person's experience. And uh, so, like right now, you're sitting in a chair, you're breathing, you're watching the video, you're taking a glass of water. Those are all things that I know to be true in your experience. Now, the more that I, the more that I reflect that with my language, the more internally, at least if you're somewhat open, you're mentally going, yes. If I say, so Antonio, you're sitting in the chair. And you go, yeah, I'm sitting in the chair. And so you get that yes set going where yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then when you take the person to the next step, which is something that you want them to do, they're much more likely to say yes, because they've got that yes frame of mind going. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, um, I was actually writing an article about this yesterday for somebody. It's kind of like the uh, pacing statements almost kind of grease the track up. Oh, exactly. And a lot of these language patterns, that's what they do. They, they make it easier. They give you an edge. They're not a magic bullet. I don't know what a magic bullet would do conversationally, but, yeah. but I guess we need grease. So. You hold up like this, be like, you better listen to me. Like, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that is one way to convince people. So yes, they make everything easier. However, you're correct. If I said to you, if we started a conversation and I said, Antonio, you're sitting in your chair and you're breathing and you're looking at the screen, you would go, what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you talking this way? <laughs> exactly. Right? So uh, you have to learn to work it into your process. In Well, there's, there's a couple of different ways to go. You could just not worry about it. If you've read about Milton Erickson at all, he was not afraid to be weird, right? He would just kind of freak people out, yeah. and they wouldn't know what to do, right? So uh, there, there was a case uh, back when I was... I believe I was president of the state NGH chapter here. Well, I know I was president of the state NGH chapter here, but I believe I was at the time and I had a, an Ericksonian hypnotist come out to talk. And she left, she came out of the bathroom and she had toilet paper in the, hanging out the back of her shoe, like stringing along like four or five feet behind her. And she went up and she started the talk. And everybody was like, what do we do? Do we tell her what, what's going on? Turns out she'd done it on purpose, right? <laughs> her idea was to get her conscious mind focused on something else. Well, so while she delivered the message, that's it was, brilliant. It was it was really interesting. So and she got me too, of course. So she obviously wasn't afraid to look or seem awkward as she was talking. So one approach would just be to say, screw it. I'm going to be awkward. They're going to look at me like, what am I talking about? What's this guy talking about? And Erickson certainly wasn't afraid to do that. He, he saw his goal in helping the client much more important than what they thought of him. Uh, the second thing you can do is find points in your process where it's easier to work those pacing statements in. Uh, and it's it's really easy, especially when somebody gives you information, right? And you say, okay, let me make sure I have this straight. You're here on Monday. You're leaving on Friday, right? That's much more natural. Okay, that's what I'll do is I kind of do a recap. I'll ask them, like, I'll give them a brief description of the boat, what it does. So I'm like, I'm like so let me get this straight. I'm like, you're here. Uh, you got here yesterday. You're leaving uh, Monday. You're looking to do um, – uh, sunset dinner cruise on Friday, whatever. And perhaps, and perhaps you might want to blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You might want some discounts on that. Is that right? Oh, yeah. You might want some discounts on that. Um, what would a tag question on that be? You might want, we'll see. I kind of think so. You might want some discounts on that, right? Something like that. A, a tag question, uh, would, would be, uh, would you maybe, would you not? Yeah. Would you not? And, uh, so, Antonio just brought up tag questions and tag questions are questions 
or they can be questions that are stated in the negative. And sometimes people are conflicted about something, right? They have part of them that wants to do it and part of them that doesn't want to do it. And a tag question gives them both sides of the equation. So it, it kind of gets rapport with, with both the want and don't want. And at the same time, it leads them to doing it. So is that like some discounts, would you not? Yeah, and that's real similar to what people would call, um, I think salespeople, I think salespeople refer to them as tie downs. Like a, like a tie down question. It's a little bit different, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Actually, back to the thing about pacing. Um, I think one one thing I was a little nervous is, you know, obviously being awkward, which I, I can be awkward at times. <laughs> But um, not so much awkward, but I was also looking for different ways for um, uh, verbal pacing. Mm -hmm. I know you've got like, you know, as you're sitting there listening to me, things like that. Are there any other, I guess, verbal pacing statements that you've developed over the years or that you've just incorporated? It's, it's much easier if you have a context which you repeat over and over again, which, which it sounds like you do. In the hypnotist's office, it's easy. You're sitting in the chair. You're listening to my voice. You came here to um, change such such a habit. It's easy because you just get used to it. So I would just look. I would just look around uh, and and use that kind of thing. But the other thing that I would encourage you to do is to pace in other ways. If if you don't feel like you can just do this verbally easily. Pace in other ways. Pace their body language, have the same body language, have the same rate of speech that they do, time your speech to their breathing, uh, use back any key emotional words that you hear them saying. And they're like, oh, well, we don't care where we, wanna, where we go to dinner. We just want to have fun. And then you know, okay, fun is a word that they landed on and that's important to them. So you feed that word back to them. So it's not all, uh, I mean, pacing the with verbal statements that just tell them what's already going on in their experience is only one very small part of, of pacing. So the, so the most important thing, so what I'm hearing, the most important thing is using an, an, an uh, undeniable truth, a truism. Yeah, that's, well, that's the pacing technique. And typically what we say in NLP is pace, 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 lead, which is you give three statements at least that you know are true and then one that you suspect or would like to be true. And that's one of the other patterns, which is called mind reading, where you say, you may be wondering how much this is going to cost you. And the chances are that's true. And you've just led. Uh, so yeah, a combination of, of undeniable truths and maybe a little mind read in there. Okay, the um, I definitely like the mind read because the, it's funny that like, you and Jeff on the program talking about you don't really like the the statement of mind read or how they call it mind read because you're not really reading somebody's mind. Because I mean, let's make no bones about it. Most people, if you read their minds, it would be boring as hell. <laughs> be boring as hell. Like I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Some days, if you read my mind, it would be. Uh... What am I gonna What am I gonna have for lunch? <laughs> what am I gonna have for lunch? But yeah. So, the, my, uh, what are some other examples of? Uh, how do I? How would I? I'm trying to get my head wrapped around. Uh, um, I, actually, I know what a mind read is. But I'm trying to help my audience understand. It's, it's not so it's psychic. Okay, not psychic. It, it's like a good educated guess. Yes, I'll, I'll give you an example of a mind read that sound that seems psychic. Uh, my girlfriend at the time and I were hanging out at her apartment. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I looked at her and I said, you're thinking of deviled eggs right now. And she went, holy, get away from me. Because <laughs> she literally had an image of deviled eggs in her head. Now, how did I know this? Right. I knew it because it was 11 o'clock and we hadn't eaten. So I, I knew her, so I knew what she looked like when she was hungry. Uh, she had glanced in the direction of a grocery store. You couldn't see the grocery store from, from her place, but she looked in that direction. The day before, we'd been in the grocery store and we'd gone past the deviled eggs and she looked at them and I saw a look on her face of desire, which I also had calibrated. I saw the same look of desire on her face about 
30 seconds earlier, she'd used the phrase, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. She had never used that phrase before in the years that I'd known her. So all these things together led me to believe that she had an image of deviled eggs in her head. And, and so I said, you're thinking of deviled eggs right now. And it totally freaked her out. Now, that was a, that was a very complex mind read. But you can do something uh, in when you're working with someone, either in sales or in a relationship or in therapy, you can make some very small educated guesses like and and you, you know, and if you see them lower their shoulders and breathe deeper, you say, and you're relaxing more. That's a mind read. And what that does to the person that you're saying it to is they start to go, this person gets me. This person understands me. It's, it's like Erickson would be, is, is it similar to Erickson saying that's right, it just reinforces what's happening? Yes. And the, that's right. So that's a, a common Ericksonian technique where you say that's right. It, you've hypnotized a lot of people, Antonio, and you know that they're often wondering if they're doing it right or if it's happening the way it should be. And if you say that's right, for most of them, that will give them a sense of, okay, it's all going okay. I'm doing it right. Yeah, my girlfriend, she, um, sometimes I try to mess with her. I go to give her a, a hug and I do that same Erickson. I'm like, that's right. And she's like, no, nah. she's like, it doesn't work in every context. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Some people react to that particular phrase. You know, yeah. sometimes, I mean, you can use good, excellent. You're doing fine. And, but, you know, maybe somebody said that's right to them when they were in kindergarten and right then a piano fell on their head. So they don't like the phrase. So. Well, if that's the case, we got something worse happening. <laughs> yes, maybe that's what you're there to, to help them with. But hopefully or, you're not a piano salesman. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Or I can just use, um, like, uh, a lot of the Catholic uh, the nuns that take a ruler and whack, like, wrong. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, when, but when somebody reacts poorly to something like that, I mean, you just use your eyes when uh, and your ears. When you're talking to somebody and you say something and they – look like they react badly, you switch it. I, I used to sell uh, clothing at JC, for JCPenney. I used to work in the men's suit department. And sometimes I would say something and they would get this horrible look on their face. And I would literally step to the side, point to where I was just standing and, and say, that's the kind of crap most salespeople say, isn't it? <laughs> and they'd go, yeah. And I go, ah, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just kidding. What, you know, what is it you'd like today? And so, you, you just are flexible in your communication. It's th these techniques are because you can mind read and be wrong. You could say, and you're relaxing even more and they're not right. And you see them tense. And so you just change your communication or perhaps, you know, and you move on. So yeah, that's pacing current and spirits and mind reading, which, which are two of the techniques that are, are covered in the program. Now, let me dig into this. So while I'm uh, flipping through this manual, pretending that I'm interested in what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got mind reading. The more oh. it actually comes true, you know. The what? The more you pretend, the more it comes true. <laughs> I Damn, cause and effect. That's actually the more pattern, but yeah. Um, so, you know, it's funny. I was actually writing an article about that. But is that an example of cause and effect? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. I mean, it's it's implied. So what what Antonio is talking about is that there's uh, people have a way that they express beliefs, right? And they express them either in cause and effect language or complex equivalence language. And and cause and effect just means this causes that. Complex equivalence is this means that. So uh, I could say the fact that I come from a heavy set family means that I can't lose weight. That's complex, <clears throat> complex equivalence, right? Yes. And so that's, that's the way that people would express a belief. And somebody might say to you, oh, I can't lose weight, or I don't want to buy this timeshare, or, or uh, I don't like you, or whatever. And then you might say, why? Why is a question we don't often ask in NLP, NLP but this is a good place to ask it. Why? Why can't you lose weight? Well, because uh, exercise is boring. Okay, so the fact that exercise is boring means you can't lose weight, or the fact that your genes are a certain way means you can't lose weight, or 
the fact that you've got a disease causes you to overeat and that overeating means that you can't lose weight. So those, that's the language of belief. And uh, it's useful if you can communicate back to someone in a language of belief, you can help to build beliefs in them. And so we just turn those language patterns around on them. And the more, the more is one such pattern. So that means the more you listen to Antonio and I about covert and conversational hypnosis, the more you understand about it. So listening more causes more understanding. And the more you understand, the better you get at it. And that means you're miles ahead of people who haven't listened at all. You know what's funny is when I was going, th- I've been going through a program, uh, soon we all have insecurities. I remember for the longest time, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to be able to do um, covert language, blah, blah, blah. And I realized I'm using a lot of the stuff when I'm actually, when I'm actually doing a formal trance with somebody, like, you know, you're sitting there, you're listening to the sound of my voice, you can feel the, the chair below you, and you've got your friends here, so you know you're safe, blah, 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 blah. I'm, just, I'm using it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's one of the greatest misconceptions about conversational hypnosis is that it's some sort of specialized language that's very complex to understand. The truth is, we all already use conversational hypnosis what what studying it does is it allows you to condense it right to use it in a much higher uh, percentage a much uh, a much more pure solution and therefore amplify the uh, the results that you get so we're already we're already using it let me see other thing let's see we covered that um oh the linkages the complex equivalents and see <clears throat> what is that linkages cause and effect linkages okay you're sitting and learning i like that one so what you're talking about there is how to link one event to another with and we call that linkages now when you think about and all this stuff is outcome oriented so if you're going to use conversational hypnosis it's good to have an idea what you want to accomplish what you want the other person to do so uh, let's suppose you want somebody to go into trance So what are the steps? What are things that people might do as they're going into trance? Uh, Shifting awareness, maybe uh, eyes. Right. So you you take, the eyes might close. Uh, So you take something that you absolutely know is happening or is going to happen, and then you just link it to that next step. So you're sitting and your eyes close. You're sitting and perhaps your awareness shifts. Okay, so there's all kinds of work. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, uh, you know the the whole things of um the, the specific but not spe- um vague but specific language, uh, feeling like certain feeling uh, feeling certain sensations. So you're sitting here and you're you're sitting here and you're noticing certain feelings and sensations. Yeah, th- those are two very uh, specific to Erickson techniques. I mean, before Erickson, most hypnotists we're simply telling people to sit down in a chair and do stuff. If you look at Dave Ellman's uh, hypnotic techniques, he was like, sit down, take a deep breath. As you let your breath out, close your eyes. Uh, If they close their eyes too soon, he would say, stop. I didn't tell you to close your eyes. You know, do as I say when I say it, right? Erickson was not that way at all. He, uh, He had permissive language. And he often spoke in very general terms. Now, the the idea is with permissive language, if I say, and you can allow your eyes to close, that's different than close your eyes, right? Make make, make me blinky over here. I know, you can see it. So, (laughs) which I love, by the way, that's one of my favorite things about teaching is watching the people just kind of, you know, go in and out of trance. I'll, I have a story about that later. So, some people, probably you and me included, don't like to be ordered around. No. Right? If somebody says, close your eyes right now, I'm telling you to, I, I, I'm going to have a tendency to go, you know what? No. Right? But what if I say, and perhaps you can allow your eyes to close? That's a true statement, and it's not even a command. Right? I didn't tell you to close your eyes. So Erickson would sort of, I think of it as sort of a smorgasbord. 
he would just list hypnotic phenomena, all kinds, and say perhaps you can allow your eyes to close and that might lead to increased relaxation and you might even yawn and that's all perfectly natural and that means you're going into relaxation in just the way that you want, right? So yes, Erickson was uh, permissive and also vague. Because if I say, and we're, we're about to get into something called nominalizations here. Um, if I say, um, go sit in the chair, th that creates a very specific set of things for you to do. It's, it's not as open to interpretation as if I say, make yourself at home. If I say relax, that means relax whatever way you want. But if I say, you know, make your hand loose and limp and relax like a rag doll, that's more specific. Erickson was very vague, very general, and that allowed people to put their own, to come up with their own internal map. And the, 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 <laughs> the here's the problem with ordering people around. What you say might not match their internal reality. If instead you elicit their internal reality, it's, it can be very hypnotic. So that's what Erickson would do. And uh, one of the ways he would do that is through what's called nominalizations, which are words that are nouns, but they're not a noun like chair. They're much more abstract. Freedom. Freedom, right. Excitement. So it's basically, I think you wrote in here, uh, a, a nominalization is a, is basically a process is it well? Um, yeah, it's a process. Yeah, I think you said it's a process that's turned into a noun, something like that. Yeah, because freedom. What, what can you can you put freedom in your shopping bag? Well, accor according to this election, there's a whole bunch of freedom <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you probably should put it in your shopping bag. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a, I've got a wall of freedom for you. Exactly, right? So, in fact, politicians are great. Oh, yeah, they're really good at nominalizations. When I say education, look, I'm for education. I support education. Well, who, who doesn't? But what do I mean by education? It's such a fuzzy term that I put my own reality on it. And that's what Erickson was doing. Uh, he would use such fuzzy words that people would put their own reality on like, it. Okay, that makes sense. So like, so like a politician saying, I'm for job security. Well, duh, everybody, it's, it's, very, it's very vague. So your job security is different than my job security. Right. And so uh, if you want to, we're talking about pacing current experience. If you use words like, or phrases like job security, that guarantees or almost guarantees pacing experience because I'm thinking what I think job security is. And that's why politicians will often go, um, I'm for education. My opponent, however, voted against raising teachers' wages, right? So they'll be very fuzzy so that they're sure that they're connecting with people when they're talking about themselves, but they'll be very specific when they're talking about their opponents. That's smart. It is smart. And, and there's some beautiful patterns. If you just learn nominalizations, freedom, respect, education, confidence, relaxation, and you just start putting, putting them in a sentence. I mean, it doesn't, if you listen back to it, it doesn't even make sense. But as it's flowing out of your mouth, it's, it's great to the listener. It's like when you discover the freedom that's inside relaxation and how it encompasses it, you can find that the freedom expands in ways that you didn't even imagine. And that's really what healing is. My, my, my shift is, boo, everything is going out. <laughs> right? That's, that's the way this stuff works. Because you have to, we call it an NLP, the trans-derivational search. You have to go inside deeply to figure out what all these means, words mean. Have you ever heard of uh, Mike Mandel? Uh, the name sounds familiar. Uh, Really, really um, good guy. He's a uh, Brit, um, Canadian, by the way, of um, I think immigrating to um, br um, from Britain. He does this thing called the the Nuvi induction. It's nominalization and unspecified verb. Mm -hmm. Those together are freaking powerful. You actually, okay. you have the exercise with that, don't you? 
I have an exercise in there where you mix, uh, you practice mixing up all kinds of phrases that have a hypnotic effect. And that's one of the things that I, actually I, I, I'm really proud of about this program. Now, other people don't see this as a great selling point, but I do. And that is the exercises in the book. When you say the word exercise, it is not the most exciting word to people's ears. But if you want hey. to uh, integrate these techniques into your uh, common everyday life, these exercises are going to help you do it. Okay, let me find that one. That one. Da, 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 da. Okay. Combining pacing experience, blah, blah. It was funny. He, um, about the, um, that Nubian induction, using nominalizations and the unspecified verbs. Listen to a lot of spiritual gurus. Spiritual gurus come across like that. Have you seen the uh, uh, New Age spiritual bullshit generator? Yes. That is, if you, that's a good way to learn nominalizations. Now, which exercise, is this the one with the, um, is that the one with the nominalization and the unspecified verbs? It's reading backwards to me, oh. but it looks right. Is it the combining presuppositions and nominalizations? I think I've got a couple of them in there. It's been a while since I looked at it, actually. Yeah, well, you made the program like, nah, I'm done with it. <laughs> I wrote all those exercises. And Jeff uh, Ronning, who's a great, uh, great guy and a really good friend of mine, was kind enough to, he, he's an incredible uh, interviewer and uh, stage hypnotist as well. And he's really good at, um, at creating products. Yes, he is. Now, if he could teach most hypnotists, mar actually, no, no, please, Ronning, if, you're, if by any chance you're listening to this, don't teach hypnotists marketing that way. That way I can actually sell my services to them. He's got bigger fish, fish to fry at the moment. Yeah, well, how's he doing? I know he's doing, um, he's still doing all of his webinar stuff. Yep, he's doing great. Oh, he's doing, last time I looked, I'm like, he's doing really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Got that covered. Got a little spacey from you talking. Maybe, maybe it's just you're a very dreamy person. I was going to be a motivational speaker, but everybody fell asleep, so I decided to be a hypnotist. It was, is that true? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. That, that that was a joke that you were gonna you were gonna <laughs> sure. Sure. Go with that. Um. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll I'll laugh. Give me like like an hour. I'll it'll catch up to me. Um. The other thing I love about this program is presuppositions. And here I've got a got a little sinus problem. So so everybody know this is some eucalyptus. I've been having a bad sinus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Well, I think it's um you know what fog is a, vol a volcanic fog it's on the island right now so it uh it's sulfur and everything it just triggers um really bad sinus problems. Lots of particulate matter in the air. Yeah. Well, presuppositions are um if I say uh my youngest cat is the smartest. Can we what see? have I what have I presupposed? Cats are smart, and you have a couple. You have more than one. Cat. I have more than one cat, and the youngest one uh, is the smartest. Also, there's some other. There's some hidden presuppositions in there, like I have some method to determine which cats are smart. I'm capable of knowing this. So here's a, a lot of these language patterns are based on this model of uh, conscious and unconscious minds, and the unconscious mind, as we know, as hypnotists, is where the power is. So our belief systems, our habits, learned patterns, all that stuff, it resides in the unconscious mind. The conscious mind, part of its job is to keep stuff out that doesn't agree with those beliefs. So, uh, and the problem is if, you're, if you want somebody to change, if you want to sell somebody something, uh, if you want somebody to, to get over a habit, well, there's a, there are protective mechanisms in, in there to keep people from changing or they just change willy nilly all the time. Whenever somebody said, Hey, you're smart. They go, Oh, I'm smart. You know? Yeah. So uh, a lot of these language patterns are designed to get stuff around the conscious resistance or the conscious uh, blocking and get it into the unconscious. And one of the ways to do that is with presuppositions, because the more you stack up presuppositions, the more uh, conscious mind power it would take to keep track of all those things. So if I say to you, out of my cats, the youngest is the smartest. There's 
three or four presuppositions in there that you would have to unpack and track down and specifically challenge. Wait a second. Do I know that he knows how to, how to um, tell the intelligence of cats? So, I'm sorry. So is it like we just take it at face value? Yeah, you take parts of it at, at face value. Typically, when somebody speaks, there might be something that you challenge, but you'll typically take the rest of it as the truth. Okay. And so that's what we want to have happen. Um, so if I say, um, I don't know how quickly you'll go into trance. If you're going to fight something, you'll probably fight quickly. Oh, we're not going to fight the actual going to the trance a bit. Okay. That's the idea. Now, you might. It doesn't always work that way. But uh, what I found is if, if you keep stacking up presuppositions, presupposition after presupposition after presupposition, you can only hold about seven things in your mind at once. And if you've got 25 presuppositions, not all of them can be blocked. Okay. Now, le now let, me, let me put a caveat in there. We, we all know there's one thing that can stop people from accepting hypnotic suggestions, and that is a strong frame of mind, a strong outcome that they already have that runs counter to that. So if, you, um, uh, if you're hypnotizing somebody and you say, and they're worried that you're going to try to steal all their money, and you say, now go to the bank and give me all your money, they'll go, no. They'll pop out of trance, right? So there, even presuppositions require or are better with a certain level of openness, right? And of course, that's helped with rapport. Uh, but presuppositions, super, super powerful. I don't know, uh, would you rather go into trance in this chair or this chair? <laughs> I did that at somebody's saw uh, uh, Methodist lady was doing a training here, just happened to meet her. So I went up, um, just playing around. We're doing a, they were doing a demo, I forget what it was. And one of her uh, students, I was like, do you want to go to, I was like, do you want to sit in the hypnosis chair or the trance chair? She's like, what's the difference? I'm like, don't worry, you'll find out. And I think she caught on later. <laughs> And even though we told the instructor, the instructor knew she she trained with Bandler back in like late seventies, so she she understood. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun, and uh, there's all kinds of different presuppositions you can use, and you can learn a bunch of them. One of the easiest is what's called uh, that that one's called the illusion of choice. Yeah, so was... you give someone several choices, all of which lead to uh, where you want them to go. Uh, so. Uh, would you like your arm to get lighter first or do you want your breathing to slow down or to close your eyes? It's up to you. Right? Apparently for you, it's close your eyes. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have my eyes are blinking over here. <laughs> so, so that's giving people a whole bunch of things to choose from all that lead to where you want them to go. And Another one is temporary. Let me, uh, show this one. So I'm just going to show a couple pieces. So I'll show you how nice the program is. And this is, is that in reverse? It is to me. I don't know okay. if it is. It should. If it's not right, I will uh, fix it later. Basically about the illusion of choice. The good thing about this program, we'll get back to what you said, is um, it's very well put together. Very, uh, very organized, clean. Yeah, thank you. And I, I have to thank Jeff as well. He, uh, Jeff interviewed me for this, and he, is, he really keeps the student in mind as he's interviewing and asks just the right questions to, to, to organize this stuff. Uh, and of course, he's, he knows a ton about hypnosis as well. So um, another presupposition is temporal. It has to do with what order you want to do things or when. Like, do you, do you, wanna, you wanna go to the movies first or do you wanna do dinner first? Right, or do you wanna do dinner before we go to the movie? Right, so the assumed uh, part in there is before we go to the movie, right? So that's the presupposition that you're going to go to the movie. Uh, so words like before, during, while, after, in the middle of, okay? So 
after you start to relax, but before you go into a trance, you may experience a coolness or tingling. Would uh, would as be an example of temporal? Yeah, as it okay. means it means time. Yeah. Yeah. So as you're going into trance, or as you your perspective begins to shift, you may find that you see this in a different way, and that's going to cause you to begin to solve the problem all on your own. Right now, so those are just examples of how you can use the patterns together, right? We've assumed the, the assumption, I don't even remember what the heck it is I said, but the assumption was their perspective was going to shift. They were going to solve their own problem. And those presuppositions were stacked up in there and the embedded suggestions and the uh, everything else was stacked up in there so much that it would be really, really hard to unpack and challenge every aspect of that. Yeah, my eyes just went, I don't know if you can tell my eyes just went, whoop, went, it's probably hard for you to tell now, but my eyes just went glossy. No, I know. Uh, uh, and you are very responsive to conversational hypnosis. And let me tell you a little story. So uh, I was teaching a class and, um, you know, some people are great at going into hypnosis through direct suggestion, through a direct induction where you go, like we talked about earlier, Elman, take a deep breath. As you let it out, close your eyes. And they do it, and they love to do that. Other people respond better to indirect conversational hypnosis. So I was demonstrating the Elman induction up in front of a group, and I was saying to this guy, you know, let your hand go loose and limp and relax like a wet dish rag or like a limp spaghetti noodle, and I was dropping it down. And in the audience, a pencil dropped. Now, what had happened is she was listening to my instructions, and how does she understand that? She's like, oh, he's telling that guy to get his, his limp uh, wrist happening. And what, is a, what does that feel like? And then she dropped her pencil. Now, she did not, and then she just kind of went, oh, oh, I dropped my pencil, and she picked it up. Now, she's not aware that she's being hypnotized conversationally but she is. So when you have only one of these skill sets, there's only a certain percentage of people that you can reach. When you have both conversational and direct hypnosis skills and you use them together, it multiplies. Oh yeah. Success. And the best, the best hypnotists I know are going full guns whenever they're working with somebody. They've got all their tools out and they're using them all in combination. It's like, you know, if you play basketball or, or the flute or whatever, but if you play basketball, dribbling is just one skill. You yeah. know, you, it's never used by itself. You never just dribble. <laughs> you know, dribbling goes with passing, with setting screens. And then on the other end, you have to play defense. So it's becoming really, really good at this stuff is like a combination of stuff all working together all at once. And you're not really thinking about it. It's just coming out of your mouth. It's brilliant stuff. Let's see. Covered a good amount. Um, we're going to go for a little bit longer. Uh, if you look below this, I don't know why I'm pointing up here. If you look below this video, <laughs> below these handsome guys, <laughs> there's that joke below the handsome guys. <laughs> Why are you pointing at your crotch, Antonio? Yeah. If you look below us, handsome guys, you'll see a link for uh, for his um for his uh, program, the practical guide to covert and conversational hypnosis, not conversational language, because we've already <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Now, um, so this part, I don't know if I can edit out. Um, I can always edit this part out. We talked about earlier. Would you want to do something where you can make a bonus where? You, Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what I'd like to offer anybody that uh, buys this from listening to Antonio's webinar here, or do you call this a webinar? Podcast, um, Podcast uh, e e ego stroke session, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is, just send me your receipt and say, hey, Keith, uh, I'd like your secrets of self-hypnosis program. I've got a self-hypnosis program. It's gotten great reviews. I'm really proud of it. And uh, this will, I'll give you access to it. And this will give you a format in which you can really use the power of self-hypnosis to become even better at covert and conversational hypnosis. And I want everybody to be better at this stuff.
You know, I actually, uh, I got that conversational hypnosis, or conversational hypnosis program. I got the self-hypnosis program a couple of years ago. Really easy. Very, very simple program. It's actually a training. Uh, I take people through because self. Wait, I'm sorry. Did you say, did you say training or raining? I said training, but it is raining. Oh, is it raining over there? <laughs> Let's see. I, it's so funny when you said that because it, it's downpour out there. I'm like, I was like, oh my god, did he did he hear that? His 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 uh, skills of um, sensory acuity are insane. That's uh, that's um, yeah, that's no, it's a training. So the the thing about self hypnosis. Now you got me off track. Yeah. The thing about self hypnosis that I think a lot of people misinterpret is that it's a skill. They think. They think hypnosis is something that one person does to another and then the magic is in the words. But learning to go into hypnosis is a skill. It took me a long time to learn it. And so I thought about really carefully about what are the skill sets that are required in order to go into hypnosis. And then I developed a little technique to help each person, to help each phase, to help a person get better at each phase of that. So I, in like a building block format, I teach three or four or five skill sets, and then I give everybody an induction, and I, and I talk about how to develop suggestions for yourself. So you can use this program to enter self-hypnosis easily, and it also has a re-induction cue so that you can get back there instantly, or almost now, instantly. How I started to do self-hypnosis, because I'm the analytical person, so if I close my eyes, I just suggestion, suggestion, my mind just... Yeah it doesn't work good. And plus I just go too deep and I forget. I'll, um, I'll precede the idea. If I'm doing self hypnosis, I'll, um, basically ask my unconscious to be like, Hey, uh, help me in this way. Blah, 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 blah. Actually I ended up, um, see, I quit drinking, helped me to quit drinking four or five months ago. I quit smoking cigarettes with hypnosis. And then I quit drinking monster during the Olympics because I wanted to test them. Like, you know, I want to test self hypnosis, see if it'll work. So it's been however month, many months the Olympics been. I haven't had a uh, monster. Well, I want I I wanted to say especially about the smoking, Antonio. My father died um, oh almost thirty years ago of lung, liver, and brain cancer. He was a two pack a day camel smoker. Jeez. And so I say to anyone who is a smoker, do whatever you need to do to stop it. It's uh, smoking kills uh, somewhere around a million people. Did I get that right? A million people a year? It's like yeah. half a million. Or a million. It's a lot. There's a lot of people in America every year. That's a lot of tragedy. So I congratulate you on doing it. And I encourage anybody else that's out there to do whatever you need to stop smoking. Um, yes. And self-hypnosis, it's, it's a great tool for that. Um, it will get you about as far as you can get on your own. And that's a lot. You can change a lot of yeah. things. So for the good news, if you look below, below this video, not in my crotch, but if you look at below this video, <laughs> to, uh, you'll see a link for his um, conversational hypnosis program. Not, uh, we'll cover the conversational language program later. <laughs> you'll see his practical guide to covert and conversational hypnosis. Get a copy of it. You can either do, I know you have the downloadable version or you yeah. have the um, version where he sends you a nice nifty um, binder. Either one. I think if you do the, the physical one, it's only like another $10, I think. Yeah, it's just the difference in the cost. Um, and it's a, a, a workbook and two CDs. Brilliant stuff. Uh, let's and, see. And what, the, what, it's, what it's comprised of is that the... the uh, on the CDs, we give, and in the workbook, we give exam. We talk about each pattern. We talk about how it works. We give examples of how to use each pattern, and usually in three different contexts. And then there's a set of exercises in the workbook that is that are designed to get you to integrate this stuff into your daily life. It is not uh, fancy. It's very foundational, is what I call it. It's like bam, this is how you do this pattern, bam, this is an exercise that will help you do it. So the fact that, the fact that it's not fancy pants material means that people are going to be able to absorb it easier. 
great pattern right there. That, that, is my, that was my goal, right? Because I've seen a lot of people out there and, and typically what they want to do is they want to make it their own. So they give different names to the patterns uh, and they, a, a lot of people are saying that they, well, they've extended them or they are, they've made them better. And in my experience, it isn't true. In my experience, the basic uh, conversational hypnosis patterns that, that uh, the early NLP guys teased out of Milton Erickson, that is the real stuff. And uh, that's at least what I think people should learn first. You can always expand on it later. Mm-hmm. Okay, one last thing. I think we covered everything. Let's see, we got two jokes out of you, got a bunch of bad jokes out of me. Um, I made a fool out of myself, made a fool out of you. We're probably going to sever our friendship forever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so maybe you can help me with this. Um, So basically, one of my goals is to get people onto my newsletter list, um, mainly to help people sell more of the products. So basically what I'm doing now is I am, I'm framing myself as the go-to guy to help hypnotists to get more online exposure, to sell more trainings and to fill, I'm sorry, to fill more trainings and sell more products. Mm-hmm. You want to, um, I guess, use some of your language patterns and just go with it and convince people to jump on the list? I would say this, you know, uh, the more that you study this stuff, the better you're going to get at it. And Antonio is a source that can help you learn more. And why would you not? I mean, you're, I'm assuming your newsletter has good free tips in it, right? Yep. Right. So sign up for Antonio's newsletter and get those good free tips and accelerate your success. But not everything's free because I will sell you some stuff just to let you know I'm putting that out there. Yeah, absolutely. We, I think everybody understands that we all have to make a living, but here's the thing. If you don't see value in it, you won't buy his stuff. If you see sure. value in it, you will see, uh, you'll see enough value to spend some money on it, and that, that'll be a good thing. And then you can close your eyes, and you can send me your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Psychically, yeah. That's, that's how you get wallets. Okay, so I think we got everything covered. Let's see. Anything else that you want to uh, throw down the gauntlet? Yeah, I just want to remind people, if you just go ahead and click on the link and grab the program, you're going to be very happy with it. And then send me uh, your receipt or just hit me up, send me an email, say, hey, I bought the program. Would you give me access to your Secrets of Self-Hypnosis program? And I will do that for you. Okay, let's see. I'll, let's see if I can do um, a pacing statement to lead into that where I don't completely butcher it. So Keith and I, you've been watching Keith and I, either watching or listening to Keith and I talking about his conversational hypnosis program. He's given a couple of really good examples. He just gave an example encouraging you to jump on my newsletter list. And perhaps you would like to dive more into hypnotic language by clicking the link and getting his program. Sounds good, Antonio. Thanks for having me on today. Definitely. Let's see. Make sure everything's recording. It should be good. Everybody go below, hit the link, and also put your name, email, or name email if it's reversed, and get on the list. And I will talk to you soon. Aloha.